16 million new cancers every year, and 13% of all deaths on the planet. But think about that. A third of them could be prevented. A third of them could be prevented with healthy lifestyle and a healthy living environment. Now, so prevention has to be part of everything. Now, a third of them could be cured, or at least managed in a chronic disease fashion in a manner where the patient will still survive for many years with a totally acceptable quality. So, think about that. The number of lives lost and uh, the economic prejudice in COVID-19. In 2011, with uh, the Harvard School of Public Health, the World Economic Forum was publishing a report on the economic burden and the cost of non-communicable diseases. And uh, we came to the conclusion that um, from 2012 to 2030, um, the cost of cancer would be 8 trillion. 8 trillion. So that's something that obviously has also a toll on the economic growth on the planet. Uh, in that context, you now think about mature worlds and emerging economies. Cancer is not a disease of the rich country. I mean, people think it is. We all always think that in emerging economies it has to be about a neglected tropical disease or a combating infections. Or, I mean, obviously, malaria is already on top of the list for many. Uh, but 80% of the burden is, I mean, I talk economic burden, 80% of the economic burden is in emerging economies. And sadly enough, this is in a context where 65% of the cases are in emerging economies. So, one might wonder. Why is that that 80% of the burden and 65% of the cases? Well, sad story again. Why is that? Because the life expectancy uh, and the survival rates of cancer patients in emerging economies and in Africa are about half the ones they are in emerging and in natural economies. Because treatment is not accessible. And uh, we'll talk uh, today about maybe the number of oncologists uh, in uh, trained in these regions, we talk about possibly access to radiation therapy and infrastructure. So, with no further ado, I will uh, introduce uh, a, um, a great panel. Um, and uh, starting uh, at my extreme right, um, Dr. Paul Park, Director of Non Communicable Diseases at Park Health. Thank you, Paul, for joining. Um, a little bit closer to me, uh, Dr. Prebo Barango. Medical Officer, Inter-Country Support Team, Eastern Southern Africa, WHO. Dr. Julie Tolobe. Uh, Julie, you are Deputy CEO for the Union for International Cancer. And uh, last but not least, uh, someone I admire uh, immensely for the way she has promoted Rwanda as a role model for health equity uh, on the planet. And uh, I'm talking about uh, Honorable Minister Agnes Binagwa. Now, starting with you, maybe, um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Binagwa, you have a strategic plan, as I understand, that's called Strategy 2020 for Rwanda. Uh, healthcare and health is paramount as part of that strategic plan. And as part of that, obviously, the combat against. Uh, non communicable disease. So, can you tell us about the plan, what you were expecting to deliver, how you would do that? So, uh, first uh, of all, uh, thank you for having me to this uh, panel. And uh, you have in this room one of the biggest champions yes. of first aid uh, in, in the fight against those neglected diseases that we can consider the cancer. <clears throat> to promoting uh, access to care. And equity, uh, for a minister like me, it's not so complicated because it's the vision of the government. It's just to implement. And out of that, we have the EDPRS, the Economic and uh, Poverty Reduction Strategy. And in that uh, strategy, uh, the government has put the fight against non-communicable disease as a cross-cutting issue. We have 12 pillars of the EDPRS. Meaning, uh, for the Ministry of Health, it's not a health issue only. 
it's easy to go to, to the minister in charge of uh, environment and talk about uh, the pollution, the cancer, fighting with cigarettes, uh, deal with uh, the minister in charge of commerce, because it's a cross-cutting issue. There is no sector that is not concerned by uh, non-communicable disease. Now, out of this strategy to implement the Vision 2020, we have the sectorial strategy, the health sector strategy, the other 31. And in that strategy, we have a strategy for non-communicable disease and for cancer. So that means uh, everything is aligned. And for each level to uh, allow better implementation, when time uh, arises, uh, we change laws and uh, plan, uh, etc. So that's how everything is linked and it's easy to, uh, to work in uh, an alignment. Of course, we still have to improve, but the, 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 the government framework is there to make it happen. Very interesting. Uh, I was reading someone somewhere, uh, Mr. Maybe my number is not correct. You will tell me that uh, we have 98% vaccination for the young uh, girl in, uh, in Rwanda when it comes to uh, HPV. 93%. 93%. So my number is, 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 is a little inflated, but it's not as bad as 47% in Texas. Right? No. So you are, again, uh, a leader. Uh, in, in that matter. Uh, can you tell us about that program and what the effect has been that you could measure already? Or is this something that will contribute to the 2020 target? Uh, this will definitely contribute to uh, the, the target uh, of uh, the country because there will be uh, less uh, young women and uh, mid-aged women uh, suffering for cervical cancer. Uh, and it's a very costly. I want to recall that uh, cervical cancer kills as much as uh, maternal death. So that means uh, as, as much as a country fights maternal death around pregnancy and delivery, we absolutely need to do whatever we can to, to prevent those uh, uh, unnecessary uh, premature deaths leading to uh, cervical cancer. So this is a long story. And the story starts with the champion we have in front of us because our first lady mobilized uh, the, the, the pharmaceutical firm uh, that was providing that uh, um, uh, vaccine. And uh, when the, the mobilization was done, the Ministry of Health entered in and uh, went concretely in the uh, MOU or the uh, Memorandum of Understanding. And we got uh, the vaccine for free for all our girls age 12. Um, if we manage to vaccinate 85% of them, and we vaccinate 93% uh, with uh, uh, a good report, and we got it for three years. And after that, because Rwanda has showcased that massive vaccination uh, of uh, girls age 11, 12, can be done. Gavi took the, the ball and make it available uh, to the world and we continue uh, this vaccination, but it's school-based, meaning it's not a program of the Ministry of Health, it's a program of the social cluster. We have the local government, we have the Minister of Education uh, uh, that are part of uh, uh, this program because the girls are vaccinated at school. And uh, it's all our, an organization to vaccinate all girls in four days across the country. And uh, with the catch-up program we have made for girls uh, 15 years during two years, we have 93% of girls aged 11 to 20 years now that are vaccinated against, uh, the, to protect themselves against uh, cervical cancer. Thank you very much, Minister. My number now of 98% is not going to be wrong for too long, if that's my understanding. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned WHO, and I would like to turn over to you, uh, Dr. Marongo. Uh, it's still my impression, or it's still our impression, that uh, cancer in Africa is flying below the radar. Uh, and you mentioned advocacy, what is being done in Rwanda. Uh, is this something that you think is sufficiently recognized uh, by international communities 
and as WHO continues to do to bring the issue higher on the agenda. Thank you very much um, for the question. Uh, I won't go over the figures and the data you gave earlier on because they are quite they are spot on. Um, cancer in Africa is often uh, misunderstood. There are very few local, there, I don't know if there's a local language for cancer in Africa. There are very few cultures that have a local language. Um, the misconception is that it's often a disease that affects the Western world. Um, but as he's presented earlier on, 70% um, of the mortality from cancer are in low and middle income countries, which Africa is. Um, the, the challenge that Africa is facing with cancer and NCDs in general is that um, Africa is undergoing demographic change. So people are getting older. Um, so as you are getting older, the risk factors for cancer accumulate. And then there's a epidemiological kind of change as well, as in people's lifestyles is changing. So tobacco, which is one of the major causes of cancer, is increasing in Africa. On the healthy diet and the other risk factors of, um, are, are, are on the increase in Africa. So this, in addition, there's a, another characteristic of cancers in Africa. In the Western world, cancers that are due to infections are coming down. But in Africa, so cervical cancer is one of the cancers that is, is associated with HPV. And also have liver cancer. So the commonest cancers in Africa will be breast, um, liver, cervical cancer, prostate, colon, and the cancer. So So a lot of them are due to infections. And so if we recognize this, um, little. Me too. You know, and another characteristic of cancers in Africa is that most of the time they come in late when it's almost impossible to treat. We don't have treatment facilities, but in, we, have, we have a lot of the burden of treatment. So we, the, the WHO has invested in it's part of, cancer is part of the global action plan, like he mentioned earlier on. This is, this is a significant part of it. Um, so there is need to have the people supporting countries to do to do advocacy um, at the regional level. We actually are implementing the bill and the Gates project that is looking at um, increasing advocacy and awareness for cancer, so that um, Rwanda is a good case. The point here they give money to scale up the um, vaccines. We also there are there are guidelines that the people have developed as well to. Um, Train, to, to support training for screening and treatment of cervical cancer. Um, so these are some of the efforts that the WHO is doing at the regional level. At the global level, cancer is high on the radar. Um, but as you are aware, Minister, um, nobody can tell your story better than yourself. The others will look at it. So we, we, there, there, there are um, a global coordination mechanism for NCDs at the regional, at the global level. Um, and what we're trying to do is to get all UN agencies on board. And with that also there's an interagency task force um, for NCDs and there's a focus for cancers. Um, we are actually planning to have to focus on cancer con to support one country per region. For Africa is there are there are only two countries um, to scale up prevention and control of cancers. Um, in addition, we um, also collaborate with the International Agency for Atomic Energy, IAEA. Um, we do impact missions to assess the readiness and accessibility of cancer control and treatment across the spectrum for countries. Um, we've had it in 43 countries in the region so far. Um, we were in Rwanda two years ago. And the whole idea is to see where the gaps are in cancer control and see what support um, the government can offer. Thank you very much. I have no, no doubt that uh, indeed uh, the issue will be high on the agenda. And, and when this is the case, maybe uh, to, to you, uh, uh, Dr. Torade, uh, when, when this is going to happen, uh, what's the priority intervention should be in the timelines 
that the international community should implement priorities uh, so that they can be translated into tangible actions in Africa. Well, we, we do have a global goal that all governments around the world have signed up to to reduce the um, rate of mort uh, mortality due to cancer and other NCDs by 25% by the year 2025. Um, we also have targets and indicators that have been signed off and we have a roadmap of evidence-based and cost-effective interventions that have been agreed and I think what we need now is to convert that into action at country level and I think for that to happen we need a sense of urgency. We've talked about the incidence of mortality but there's also 36 million people living with cancer in this world and those that are living with cancer where there's poor health systems are really suffering alone. Um, so we do really need strong African leadership and, and we're seeing in Rwanda how that's making such a difference already. But we also need creative partnerships. We need to shape implementation for the country needs. And we've learned a lot this last few days here at World Economic Forum about great examples of how we can translate that into cancer care solutions. Um, so I think your know, voices from Africa are really important now. Firstly at the government level to really drive um, progress and it's great to see that the policy frameworks and the legal frameworks are starting to be put into place but we also need strong voices at government to negotiate to get the access to medicines and technologies and really get those carers, the health workers, they're the ones that provide the service, right? Medicine in itself does not solve the problem. You need the people, you need the skills. And I think the second African voice that we will start to see coming through are the, are, are the patients, the survivors. They are going to be the ones that are going to drive health system improvements. They're going to demand African data, African research to shape the solutions. So let's get some survivors and I think we'll see more progress. Um, an important thing for me today is it's also your cross-sector work. It's great to hear that UN agencies are working the cross-sector and it's great to hear the government in Rwanda is really thinking about a holistic solution. But I think we all as a cross-sector need to think about harnessing our energies. You know, we say at UICC, cancer is everyone's business, you know, not just healthcare. Um, we've been working very hard in the last few years to look at evidence for the investment case, the economic case for building cancer services. And we released just last year both um, economic reports on surgery and radiotherapy. And um, it, it shows very clearly that um, radiotherapy not only saves lives, um, but also is a cost-effective intervention which will bring in a return as an investment within a 10 to 15 year time frame. But I think we have to be clear in, in poorer countries that the upfront costs are high and there needs to be international support to get that basic infrastructure in place. Thank you very much, Julie. Uh, and, and obviously you mentioned partnership. And, uh, and uh, to you, Dr. Park, you're, you're living here in Rwanda. You are actively working in partnership in the establishment of the infrastructure for cancer services. I don't know if it covers radiation therapy, by the way. I hope you have the means to uh, get some of those Linux in place. But uh, in case you you don't, you can still me you can still tell a few words about uh, what you're doing with the Bitaro clinics, maybe, and how many more of those clinics do you think you could uh, open uh, in, uh, in partnerships with private sector, international organisation, and the London. Yeah, thank you very much for that question. So I, I completely agree that the key is strategic partnering. And for our partners in health, from our experience, we've had the luxury of working very closely with the Rwanda government. We were invited back in 2005, and since then, with the initial request that we come in and provide support in rural communities, uh, specifically with HIV care, HIV care delivery, that was really the introduction. But since that successful interaction with the government, we've been able to continue. And based on the needs and the requests of the government, we've been able to respond and provide the structural support where needed. You know, I think that you know, one thing that Partners in Health really believes in, in collaborating and establishing strong partnerships, is that when we talk about rights, such as you know, the right to health care, the right to education, for example, that these rights are to be conferred by the governments. Partners in Health is an NGO. We do not come to Rwanda planning to deliver rights. No. We are here to support the government to deliver those rights. So I think 
that government-led approach is probably the most important component of a successful partnership. And then when we talk specifically about the cancer program, specifically with Tara, we like to look at it as framed in the accompaniment model. So when I say accompaniment, I'm really focusing on two components, investment and innovation. So when the Butaro Cancer Hospital was started, there really was no hospital at that time. At the time, the district was without a true district hospital facility. So together with the government, we saw that the need to invest in physical infrastructure, and then capacity building and providing uh, a strong support staff, providing technology, equipment, et cetera all within the, the leadership of the ministry. And so, once you have investment, then comes the innovation, which is equally important. So, together with the government, we've been asked, ever since the initial components with the 2005 HIV model, but now with cancer and other NCDs, what are innovative ways that low-income countries can deliver NCD care, particularly with cancer, which you know, provides a whole landscape of very complex challenges, such as you know, pathology. We now, together with the ministry, have been able to implement a very innovative telepathology system uh, that, that really is you know, leading the charge worldwide of showing that complex pathology services are able to be delivered, not just in low-income settings, but rural settings, when you have the proper investment, the proper innovation. And you know, to that point of, of your last question of you know, how can we you know, scale this. Is this an isolated facility? And it's not. Everything we do, because we are functioning within the partnership framework, we know that as Rwanda expands and builds more cancer facilities, whether it's in Kigali or other regional or referral hospitals, we know that the lessons learned, the experiences, the data, because we're doing it in partnership, that it's, it's together with the ministry and that those valuable lessons learned will be directly used. And we are happy to accompany that process for further scale up and replication of the successful experiences. Thank you very much. That's very, uh, very inspiring. Uh, uh, talking about innovation, I would like to uh, also, Honorable Minister, uh, maybe flag one issue. Maybe it's not an issue. but. I, I see, you know, we have that uh, cancer moonshot uh, session in Davos, and, uh, and um, then we, we had Vice President Biden and, and looking into uh, actually solving cancer, curing cancer. And, and obviously, we talk about clinical analytics, big data, genomics, we talk about uh, regenerative medicine, immuno-oncology, gene editing, uh, we talk about vaccination for hepatitis C and in the prevention of liver cancer and all of that is costing a lot of money and in the meantime you need to build uh, an infrastructure where you have radiation therapy equipment uh, and at the end of the day I mean are we not ending in a situation where some countries in the world maybe not Rwanda but some countries in the world or maybe in East Africa end up with the clinical solution of the 20th century when in mature economies they enjoy the benefits of the innovation from the 21st century. Uh, that's uh, not only in the, the fight against cancer, it's all. Even uh, when you see a vaccine like the pneumococcus that was uh, really built in Kenya, and Kenya waited many years to have access that for their own children. So <clears throat> this is another area where international partnership can bring some ethics and uh, some legal framework and, and conduct of conduct. We are all together. We can fight for that. Uh, but uh, we, we are really willing to be part of research and innovation. And we do. We do. Uh, but when uh, the new innovation is on the market, most of the time the financial accessibility is so difficult that then at international advocacy and partnership need to, to come and, and make it accessible. But <clears throat> the example we had for HPV vaccine, the example we had for access to uh, the drugs uh, with, with Galliard, the access to the drugs for hepatitis C, when as a government and with some partners we go and advocate for a reduction of price, at least 
uh, reduce the benefit of the farm. Because sometimes also, the, the, the new innovation, uh, innovation that is uh, created, let's say value 1,000, but because it's an innovation, it sold 100,000. Huh? So there, there is some sanity that we can all together come and bring uh, on, on health for, for better access to the population. But there again, the partnership, the contribution to research, um, the, and innovation is key. Okay. Another thing is that a lot of research is done um, not necessarily on the type of cancer we are suffering here in Africa. Uh, and um, uh, this is also new partnership in research that we had to create with institutions like in, uh, the National Institute of uh, Health, etc., in, in the US or some European organization, so that we can also contribute to advance the science, but a portion of science that are in the interest of Africa, meaning help Africa to grow, build, educate researchers, and also have a center like in Butaro, we are working together to make it a site that is suitable for international research so that we can test together a new treatment that will benefit Rwanda and the region. So there is a lot of, and that's why this forum is important, because it brings together the people who have the money to have factories, the universities who have the brain to do research and the platform where we can contribute to accelerate those research for the benefit of our people. Thank you very much. And I, I'm, I'm sensitive to that you have to leave in a few minutes, uh, as you have an over event, right? So, uh, about, about research and innovation. Uh, obviously, cancers are not, it's not one disease, it's not a monolithic event. It's, uh, and cancers in Africa, from time to time, differ uh, very much so from the ones in natural economies, but the market being what it is and the market forces being what they are, uh, labs in the natural economies would invest in cancers, not necessarily the ones that are prevailing in the African population. What can you do about it? It's again about partnerships, be proactively uh, informed on what the science is and approach those uh, entities that, that, that are doing research to include us. And uh, as we go, the world is more and more open to, to that. It's also had universities to have partnership among uh, universities from the north and from, and, and from the, the south, and interest <coughs> in factories uh, to, to that Africa is a growing market. Uh, that uh, if they invest here, uh, uh, there is a very good promising uh, return in money. Uh, and that uh, sometimes having few people in the north is better to have a lot of people in the south for business purpose. So there is a lot of discussion where forums like this are uh, very interesting, even for the health sector and the health outcome. But you need always, as government, to accompany this uh, with innovation in policies, strategies, uh, in access to care, like what we do now. Uh, every one man that uh, is a civil servant uh, or employee, official in, the, in the, the classic way, can have a checkup, annual checkup. We have done the same under the community health insurance uh, for 12 cents uh, in dollar. Um, and in Rwanda, about 35 years for a woman, 40 years for a man, can do a checkup, and if some alert is there, can go for a full checkup. Because early detection is also the most important thing for not coming late, like uh, our colleague from Berlin Show was saying. Uh, too many people <coughs> are coming late because of uh, ignorance. So we need to proactively promote those uh, uh, checkup, annual checkup for each and every one. Thank you very much. And, and precisely, Dr. Baron, I mean, uh, the role of WHO in, in, in helping accelerate access to care in Africa. I mean, it's possible that Rwanda is in a better situation than many African countries. 
if you look at the continent at large, what can be done? What practical measure can be pushed by, for instance, IRC or WHO to actually accelerate access? Yes, thanks. Um, to accelerate access, um, it's still collaboration and using um, local resources. Um, the, the need for partnerships, like um, she mentioned earlier on, um, it's very, very, very important to see, um, like the private sector. Uh, the, the, there is less involvement of the private sector in research and in dissemination of this research for chronic diseases, especially in Africa, because of um, the people don't see the good returns from, from it. But with IAC, WHO's um, uh, specialized agency for research in cancer, um, they, we are strengthening uh, to, to make a case for cancer. So cancer registries, we are, we, are, uh, we are strengthening countries to develop and strengthen their cancer registries. That way, um, you have evidence that, yes, it's not just um, hearsay, but cancer is a growing body. So countries are strengthened to develop and strengthen their cancer registries. Uh, there are also innovative research that are disseminated to countries. Um, we've also, like uh, for cervical cancer, this screening with uh, VIA and cryotherapy, which is usually is cost effective in low resource settings. We've also disseminated that. Yes, and, and that fits probably very much so with the part what you're doing because a lot of what you do is actually working at the community level. And, uh, and a lot can be done at the community level. Uh, how are you in the, your community uh, center strategy with NCD's prevention fit? And, and also, on a side note, uh, how, is there, is, what do you do for cancer survivors I mean, in those communities? Uh, thank you for that question. So, uh, absolutely. So, Partners in Health with the Utaro Hospital, uh, we are working together with the ministry already based in the rural community. Utara Hospital is a district hospital, but it's in a very rural setting. And so immediately, in terms of this discussion of access, we've already increased access um, for you know, rural communities, showing as, as a model for many low middle income countries where the only access to care is in the capital city. But we're actually creating a model to show that access to care doesn't have to be confined to just those who happen to live in the capital city. And so, you know, part of, um, you know, as others have, sta have stated, is trying to create you know, innovation to provide greater access. And, you know, one of the great examples that we, we have is we have a research, an implementation research study together with the ministry where we're looking at how to bring access to care, not just at the district level, but all the way down to the health center level, where we've trained nurses to do clinical breast exams. And so that nurses are more aware of breast cancer symptoms, with breast cancer being the most common cancer we see here in Rwanda thus far. And so, through these innovative models, we can create more access uh, to you know, those who are in the most rural communities. If you look at Rwanda's numbers, for example, 79% of the population lives in the rural community. And so already right there, we have to ask ourselves, of that 79%, is it really realistic and affordable whether you're talking about Rwanda or other low-income countries, to ask them to travel every month to receive their chemotherapy to the capital city. So I, I, I agree, and I think Partners in Health is really trying to work together with the government to, to be at the forefront of creating that type of accessibility. If I can add something <coughs> before uh, going, <coughs> what um, is it just say it's so important that we have created a pyramid of care in Rwanda. We have the referral at uh, in cities, teaching hospital, tertiary specialists. In each district, we have a district hospital with doctors. And in each of those district hospitals, we have trained doctors and nurses for breast cancer palpation, etc. And uh, let's say 30% of them now can do in a very safe and uh, replicable manner the 416 sectors. In each of them, except 15, we have a health center with nurses. They also are doing, using the health instruments, which are the Santé. Uh, we have 90% uh, of our Rwandan, all Rwandan, 
uh, instrument for health insurance, and the package of um, of uh, the, the annual screening is in, is inside that the the, the, the benefit of uh, uh, the affiliated to any type of health insurance in Rwanda, even the community health insurance. So we have that at health center, and we propose we, we mobilize the, the, the population to go for that checkup where they have to receive a breast cancer evaluation and advice and uh, uh, for early, uh, early detection. So um, it is a national program that will allow us to detect early, but it's a long way to go because. Um, uh, it's like in the beginning of the epidemic of HIV, when people believe always that people infected were people almost dying, cachectic, etc. That they, they need to understand that you can have HIV and be uh, healthy, totally. You can have a cancer and be healthy, and the day you have the first sign, it's too late. So we really uh, uh, need to, to, to work on that. But I really want to insist on its partnership with people in country like you, with international organizations for good guidance, with advocates like you uh, to move mountains, with our first lady that is always with us uh, in all those innovations. And uh, uh, when we have a good deal, we just come and ask uh, a voice. And uh, she's there for the people of Rwanda. And also with people like you to do panel like this that um, bring awareness to the, the, the people. So, you know what I want to do so. <laughs> With the AU, um, yes, absolutely. Because um, uh, with the AU, it's also a very good panel. Uh, because, um, and it's also, Africa has so many emergencies to deal with. Hmm? Uh, natural resources, etc. Infectious disease. Now we start to see many cancer because it means that Africa has done some success in management of infectious disease. We live longer. So, and unfortunately, we were so focused on infectious disease that we did focus on the other disease. So it's not a neglect. It was uh, like we need to run, to run, to run, and to run to catch. Thank you very much. Want to go? We, we have been talking about community, and 79% of the population living in rural areas. Uh, with that said, you would find situations where actually the organization is happening even faster than it happens in Rwanda, and then. Addressing cancer in cities is an overload. So, I think you have a program on this initiative. Are you planning to launch an initiative in that form? Yes, that's right. And I think it's it's always planning for the future, as, as we've been discussing. And you know, globally, already 54% of the world's population are live in urban areas, and uh, this is expected to continue. And uh, by 2045, it's anticipated that. Um, people living in cities will have increased by 1.2, 1.5 times, so adding 2 billion people to the urban um, settings. Um, when you think that 60% of the global GDP is generated in cities, then urbanisation should be seen as something positive that we need to harness. Um, a World Bank really, feel, um, really stated last year that they feel increased productivity will allow and stimulate innovation and emergence of new ideas. So, um, you know, UICC is really thinking about this, and you know, I didn't ask the Minister to talk about the progress of care, but it fits very nicely, and that we obviously need to get good cancer centres in these urban settings, but it does need to be connected to that pyramid of care and connect the communities and, and rural settings. So UICC is um, looking to launch a campaign next year and really appealing in this forum for partners that can help us shape that programme. We'd like to reach out to city leaders and, and set them a challenge to establish these cancer centres and work with us to create data partnerships to really make this work, harness on the, uh, the good models and innovative ideas we're seeing emerging in Africa to really drive um, progress. So that's what we're going to be doing and we're really looking forward to working with many here to make that a reality. Yes. Thank you.
I think you always have to the forum, you already found your first talk. That's excellent. So, so, so thank you very much. I think I'm at the end of all my questions, but I also recognize that we still have six or seven minutes. And, uh, and we have a fantastic panel, and I think you should enjoy also gaining additional insights by asking yourself some questions. So if someone could end the mic, and if we have anyone that would like to ask a first question, to our three panelists. Hi, my name is Ethan Van Rutten. I'm with the Hi, my name is Ethan Van Rutten. I'm with the Private Equity Firm investing in amongst other sectors healthcare. Um, and we've just raised a billion dollar fund book, finalizing that to invest in providing affordable healthcare in the NCD space in Africa and Asia. So my question really is about as the double disease burden is hitting and the private sector is starting to really think more about how to address NCDs and specifically cancer. Some of the challenges we're finding from the private sector perspective, again, is uh, the gap at the primary care level, because you need the referral put in, and so there's significant capacity building which is necessary at the primary, primary care level. The question I have for all of you is, how would you advise we think this through? Uh, because the alternative is uh, we end up building specialist secondary and tertiary care facilities without properly addressing these uh, I have another question. Are we going to this one first, maybe? Uh, and maybe, I think that's not a question for one of you, I think it could be a question for each of you as well. I would like maybe to talk to primary care, uh, starting with you and then with Julie. Yeah, I'm happy to start. Thank you for that question. Um, you're, you're absolutely right. That's, that's one of the critical barriers we see. And you know, I would focus on, on two potential avenues to try to, to answer that challenge. The first one being working together with the government to be able to increase uh, awareness. So having these <coughs> excuse me, advocacy and awareness campaigns all the way at the community level. So if, if we could learn lessons from the HIV experience, where there were literally armies of campaigners that were going out into the most rural communities. So speaking the local language, uh, speaking in the context, in the context-specific manner that makes sense for those who are who are trying to educate. So that type of broad, wide-scale campaigning, equal if not greater than that of HIV, because with the HIV, some of the approaches of that campaign were a little bit more simplistic because of the nature of the disease. But NCDs, especially cancer, comes in a very broad and wide variety of forms. So it's going to require a bit more of a dynamic campaigning and education approach. So I think that's first and foremost one. But once you have someone that comes from the community level and are identified and they need to be receiving care at the tertiary level, then you have a challenge of retaining them. So loss of follow-up is a huge challenge that we have in all chronic disease management. And so to try to combat loss of follow-up, it not only depends on the health infrastructure that you have at the tertiary hospital. Are you calling patients? Are you using mobile phone technology to try to remind them of when their appointments are? But even you know, beyond that, are you able to um, create, again, the, the incentives and the uh, yeah, create the community-based incentives where the patient understands their disease. And so even you know, if they come to the tertiary facility one time a month, when they go back home, you know, we've tried, uh, we've implemented such ideas like support groups. Having, we've had breast cancer associations that emulate early HIV patient associations. So having that community-based presence to really reinforce, even when they're not in the same hospital, when they're at home to be reminded that you know, cancer is a chronic disease that requires lifelong follow-up, that requires home-based self-management, and you know, requires you know, a community-level input. So I think you know, it's, it's a very important point you raise, and there's, those are some, uh, I think, two points to address. Thank you very much. Um, the NCDs, the chronic diseases, uh, Dr. Peter came out with what is called best buys. These are a set of interventions that any country, irrespective of their socioeconomic uh, standing, can afford to implement. Um, and the like of this, there is what we call the PEN, Package of Essential NCD Interventions that 
that um, can be provided at the primary care level. Um, because we need to appreciate that Rwanda is not just alone here. Most, in most of the African countries, more people live in the rural areas. And so they need to access care at the lowest level. When it, and they need to have access good quality care. And knowing that, unlike HIV, NCDs can't have, we can't have, a, we can't have a global fund for NCDs. We, the, the PEM package integrates um, management of NCDs, chronic NCDs, with the other system. So, it, so it's not a parallel system, but it's coming up. So you are, you are not bringing up a new model. It's just that if a patient comes, if the woman is within 30 to 49 years old, ask a question, have you been screened for cervical cancer? She says no. Would you like to be screened? And this is the, the, the primary health care person can screen and is linked to strengthening the health system. There's a clear referral system. Um, when if she's positive, the person, the healthcare worker knows what to do and where to go to. Um, I think that's the way to go, but um, because it's sustainable and with little resources, we can do that rather than having, we can't afford to have um, a parallel system for SCDs. That's been integrated into the care. It's a very good point. I think we need, the first thing you need to do is change mindsets. Um, I think there's still a lot of people when they think of cancer, they look at a cancer hospital and say, you only come out, in, you know, lie down in a coffin. You, you go in there and you die. So if you can't change that mindset, then you can't really get people to think about early detection or even uh, health promotion and prevention. So we need to enter a dialogue uh, in the community and really change those mindsets. I think we have some really nice examples coming through in the cancer community of managing the, um, the flow from primary through district to tertiary hospitals and I think we need to share that, those success stories to create you know, useful uh, models. If we look at breast cancer, for example, um, you can't just mobilise the population and then expect that the tertiary centre to deal with every woman that has a lump in her breast. We need to think about how we would triage those um, those concerned cases to make sure that the cancer centre is dealing with malignant cases. And we have models where, where countries are working on that and I think it's really important to share. There are definitely very clear packages of activity that can be built into primary care, signs and symptoms, um, information about screening, information about what a person can do to reduce their risk. That all, if they start early, then I think people are more ready to engage with the health system when they do have a concern. Um, so I think you know, we need to give people time, we need to educate, we need to change the community dialogue, um, but keep pressuring um, to, to really share these models. And I think WHO is a great vehicle to share the great cases that some countries are generating. Thank you very much. Uh, very good, uh, very good. Thank you. Uh, sorry, you, you, had, you, had a, you had a question. Yes, I have a question. Uh, my name is Farid Tazwa, I lead G Healthcare for, for Africa. Um, and my question is around, you know, public-private partnership, because I think what you touched on, including the whole area around access and affordability, is, uh, is big on our agenda. I think I speak for some of the private sector. But it's more about, you know, how do you see uh, an effective collaboration with the private sector, the likes of ourselves, the likes of the Fortis that you know, on oncology and, and cancer have been developing interesting uh, solutions going forward, but more to make it economically and clinically viable and sustainable at the time. I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Sure, I can, I can start. So, you know, as, as a representative of a nonprofit organization, uh, I can give my thoughts, uh, but I, I definitely don't represent the, the public private sector per se, but you know, the, the challenge of launching cancer programs, I think you know, it, it absolutely requires that level front investment. So you know, I, I think when there's a private-public partnership, uh, the, the commitment for you know, the upfront costs obviously have to be there. But then when you look at the long-term plan, you know, obviously at some point, once you have the upfront investment, it's going to turn around and create the appropriate revenue 
But at the same time, you have to be, in my opinion, be realistic of what that time frame is going to look like. I think a lot of low-income countries, they absolutely are urgently needing greater access to Canada. We absolutely love to engage in that type of partnership. Um, however, the reality is many of the patients that, for example, you look at Rwanda, going back to that 79% number, the likelihood that they or government or someone, another entity is going to be able to pay the appropriate user fees, pay the appropriate cost of the care, uh, to eventually over time turn around a revenue, you know, that's going to take time. Um, but the vast majority of patients that need the care urgently really don't have the, the means to afford it. So, you know, I, I absolutely think that, you know, this type of partnership has a lot of fruitful promise and I encourage it. Uh, but I think we also have to think of the long time frame when uh, the, the turnaround time is producing uh, that I wouldn't like to go for you to waste uh, we, we start using people obviously because we have we are. I'm not I'm not more optimistic. I'm like this is exactly what we want to achieve with the city cancer challenge. We want to harness the experience that you all have had in the private sector, but I think we need to think big, we need to think big partnerships, single public-private partnerships here and there, harness it, bring that together and really be bold and try and move the, move the market a little bit faster and that's exactly what we want to do. And so we'd be really open to, to learning from you and, and, and coming up with some great ideas and showing that it works. Well, Dr. Narongo is the last word. Um, thank you. Um, with the WHO, um, the global coordinating mechanism. The, we have we have actually entered into a partnership with the International Federation of Consumer Manufacturers and Associations (IFPMA), um, and they are doing into prevention. Um, the fear with the private sector has always been conflict of interest um, with the UN system. It's always been conflict of interest. So, but having that in mind, a lot of the times. If, if we're innovative ways of um, having this partnership, like we've done with the, the IPMA, we're hoping that it's going to open doors for the other <laughs> private sectors. And that's where the World Economic Forum, we're very proud to work support the global coordination mechanisms of the WHO <coughs> and we're working hand in hand with the land and the as we facilitate caucuses in events to come, including in China at the you know, meeting of the new champion, we'll be working with the WHO on that particular topic. And, uh, and also in Italy, uh, we, uh, we, we do that. So, listen, I need to thank you. It was a very good discussion. I think we covered a lot of ground. Uh, I appreciate uh, you came uh, after the event, and I hope you learned a lot and you became advocate of the cause. Thank you very much. <laughs>